Welcome back to the period panel, proudly supported by Active Iron. Sarah, it's great to have you on the period panel. No problem. Thanks for having me. So for those who don't know you, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Sarah Davis. I am a weightlifter for Great Britain and England. Um, I've been to three Commonwealth Games um, and Olympic Games, and I've just been selected for my eighth World Championships um, and about the same European Championships, um, having won um, silver medals at the Europeans um, in 2021 and a silver and a bronze this year, um, and also won world silver medals in 2021. Well, congratulations on the on the selection and best of luck. Thank you. So, as you mentioned, you have had a couple of successes um, in weightlifting, but take us back to the start. Were you involved in sports as a child? Yeah, so I was a gymnast as a kid. Um, no one really knows where the desire to be a gymnast came from. Um, I was bouncing off the sofa and doing forward rolls as, as kids do and <laughs> kept pestering my parents to take me to gymnastics. Um, eventually they gave in and let me go. So um yeah that was where it all started really I did gymnastics till I was about 14 um okay. kind of phased it out over the kind of 12 to 14 um for various reasons um one of them being in the early 2000s as a female to have a six pack and pecs wasn't that normal like we didn't have as many like female athletic role models um so that did lead to bullying and I think that's a big part of it is I kind of wanted to be quote unquote normal like everyone else mm -hmm. in school um I obviously look back at that now and I'm like oh that was a silly decision but um we live and we learn um and after I stopped doing gymnastics I was a little bit lost because I used to be at gymnastics like 27 hours a week um mm -hmm. so to go from that to kind of having all this extra time I didn't really know what to do um I tried a few little bits I went to dance um I played golf to a reasonable level um got down to seven handicap which was all right and played for my county um but never found anything I loved quite as much as I loved gymnastics um and it wasn't until I st started university um I then ended up being friends with a few of the weightlifters that were on our national team at the time um training for 2012 and they basically said oh why don't you come and give weightlifting mm. a try um and I did and it turned out I was quite good at it and <laughs> I am many many years later do you think that um, your background in gymnastics kind of helped her for that transition into weightlifting absolutely um I think you know obviously weightlifting is the strength and power which obviously mm -hmm. people expect it to be, but also the the flexibility to be in the bottom of a squat with a bar above your head requires a lot more flexibility than people maybe realize. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the gymnastics background taught me the mindset that it took to be an elite athlete. Yeah. I maybe didn't have the ability to action that at 12 years old, um, which I think is what is one of the big things with gymnastics is that, abilities to so young have that mindset and I just didn't have mm -hmm. it um but I feel like I've learned from that and was able to apply that to my weightlifting um to be able to be the best I could be yeah it can be a big ask of a kid really um yeah. to try and to try and get in that mindset and obviously you know you do have some children that kind of you know tune into it but others it takes it, it takes yeah. some time and it can, it can be later in life it could be 16 18 honestly even like 22 before yeah. people tune in but it doesn't mean that they, they don't have the ability or, or capability to to be um you know a, a top athlete um in terms of um weightlifting can you explain to us a little bit about how the competition works and the type of lifts that you do um and I know there's a cumulative score is there yeah so Weightlifting is two competition lifts. So there's snatch, which is with a wider grip straight from the floor directly to above your head. And mm -hmm. then the one that most people recognize is clean and jerk. So that's from the floor to your shoulders and then your shoulders to overhead, which is generally what people try and do when you tell them that you do weightlifting. They give you some weird half demonstration <laughs> of a clean and jerk. Um, so the way it works is you get three attempts at snatch, three attempts at clean and jerk, and then the total is your best snatch plus your best clean and jerk. Um, in like the Olympics and the Commonwealth Games, there's only a medal for total. Um, but when it comes to Worlds, Europeans, um, it's you get a medal for snatch, a medal for clean and jerk and a medal for total. Um, yeah, so unlike, I guess with like high jump, you get three attempts at each height. Mm -hmm. 
with weightlifting, you get three attempts at each lift and that's it. So it's about the tactical of making sure you select the right weight for your first attempt that is Mm -hmm. good enough to get you up kind of in the mix, but not too challenging that you could essentially strike out because that's not what you, because you could repeat the weight, but you want to get that score on the board straight away. You don't want to have to be repeating it because that first snatch is really scary because there's a lot riding on it. It's always the most Mm. nerve-wracking lift of the whole competition. Um, So you want a weight that's kind of going to put you in the mix, but also not dangerous that it's going to, you know, mean you're going to bomb out and miss all three lifts. Mm. So there's a lot more tactical. I'm sure that um, you don't want to start too light either because then as you're working off that you're going to kind of tie yourself out from repeated reps, is it? Yeah, if you start too light, you're going to have to take, you know, bigger jumps or whatever and Mm. you're putting yourself at that risk. So there's a lot of relying on the coaching team um, and trusting them going into it with how your training's gone. You'll have an idea of where you want to start. Um, But that first one is very much about getting the most out of you um, and playing it relatively safe. Um, mm-hmm. And then after that, you start worrying about what everyone else is up to. Good stuff. Um, so just after you started weightlifting, um, you began pageantry as well. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, they both kind of started like within a couple of months of each other. Um, so I was working in a pub as a student and there was an advert for the local pageant, Miss Leeds. Um in like a local magazine type Mm -hmm. thing and um I was working in like a proper old man pub (laughs) you know it's just full of locals and the advert was there and it's people going oh you should enter you should enter and Mm -hmm. I'm like no it's not for me I very much had the stereotype of what pageants were what a pageant girl is um which to look back on now you know I realized how wrong I was um but I essentially gave into some peer pressure and entered the pageant I ended up winning and then going through to a four day Miss England final. And I was very much out of my depth. Um, and I was like, okay, I've, I've done it now. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. done. Um, but then I'd been sat on it for a couple of months and, you know, it drawn some kind of media attention and stuff like that because it was um, off the back of 2012 and obviously I was a weightlifter. So although I didn't go to 2012, there was still a lot of sport like hype around. Yeah. Um, and then, as we started building up to the Glasgow Commonwealth Games in 2014, I got a lot of sort of interest in it. And I was like, do you know what? Maybe this is my opportunity to be the person that I needed at 12 years old as a gymnast to be like, look, you can be muscular and have your own definition of what feminine is and all of those things. So then I ended up competing again um, in pageants and it becoming, I guess, my hobby more as weightlifting became a job. I kept Mm -hmm. pageants there as my hobby and that opportunity to be that person that I needed. Um, And off the back of that, I have received like messages on social media from people that have been, you know, maybe unsure that whether an athletic career is for them because of the stereotype that comes with that. And then they've read my story and realized that you can be all of the things you want to be and Mm -hmm. still, you know, be a woman and be feminine and whatever that looks like to you. And you mentioned that it wasn't what you expected. So what were some of the things that you had expected and weren't true or vice versa? I mean, I just expected it to be the stereotype of like the miscongeniality, the sort of tall, <laughs> skinny, blonde and like, well, peace. Um, but actually, you know, I've made some good good friends through pageantry, um, you know, women who are successful in whatever their field is, whether they're teachers, lawyers, um, dentists. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of, very powerful women and actually it's a really empowering environment to be a part of um and for me you know through my kind of formative years being a male dominated sport whether it was golf or weightlifting to walk into a room full of women that I had maybe nothing in common with and that ability to have a conversation was really Mm -hmm. daunting for me um so to build that skill set was you know a massive thing for me and actually I was like it scares me to walk into this room. I shouldn't feel scared to walk into this room. I need to work on that. So actually by keeping competing, help me develop those skills. There's also an interview round. um, So that ability to walk in, talk to a panel of six people about yourself, answer questions has been quite useful when it then comes to my athletic career, doing podcasts, doing interviews, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I'd like to think it's given me a 
a better step and be able to to talk to you know have a platform and to use my voice Mm -hmm. and there can be a bit of a traditional view that there's girly girls and that there's sporty girls what are your thoughts on that yeah I mean I feel like I very much bridge that gap (laughs) Um, yeah (laughs) weightlifting and pageants is a very large oxymoron but I think you know everyone has that ability to be everything um yeah and you know you don't have to fit into one box I actually had this conversation with one of the girls um on the team recently she was like oh but I want to be a student and I want to you know do this and have friends and go out but also be an athlete and I'm like you can be all of those things yeah and I think that's a big societal thing is you know you're this person and that is your only identity but Mm -hmm. actually especially when it comes to athletes that becomes quite dangerous because if my only identity was to be an athlete when my career comes to an end that then puts a lot of athletes in a very difficult position that they don't know who they are when that's removed Mm -hmm. from them and I think it's something that we need to probably push a little bit more that you know you can have all of these things so that you have more options in a career and even if it's not athletes like people go into a career thinking that's for them and then it's not Mm -hmm. and then they feel this kind of crisis and like loss of identity when you know maybe they're not enjoying that career as much as they should do and they feel like they can't then change career because everyone defines them as whatever that is um so I think it is important that we have all these different things that we're Mm -hmm. able to do um yeah yeah no I think that's um totally right around, around athletes like it can be quite a difficult transition when people are retiring and that can be when retirements are planned not a mind if somebody gets injured and their career like abruptly ends which can be really really tough and you know obviously there's things like coaching and media and other things that you can do but that's not something that obviously people always want or that's available to them so um yeah and even like you know when you go through times of plateauing in development like that can be tough as well so sometimes you just want to get out of that space and not be looking at the you know your coach all the time or your your uh your colleagues like you want to just get a bit of space and and do something else which can kind of refresh you when you come back into sport yeah I mean it's something that like I've tried to do recently is to have a hobby and other things other than weightlifting Mm -hmm. obviously I'm a weightlifter I train that's my job because I'm funded I also coach weightlifting so that's more Mm -hmm. weightlifting in my life my boyfriend is also a weightlifter I'm like okay I need something (laughs) other than weightlifting in my life yeah (laughs) yeah um so I've started going to dance class because it's something to do like it keeps me like it's an active thing but it's not going to put me at risk of injury for sport um and then I'm also not ice hockey or anything (laughs) no or like bungee jumping or something yeah yeah you might be safe here (laughs) <laughs> you might be safer doing the bungee jumping than you would be in in, in ice hockey that's, here that's or boxing true. or something like that. <laughs> yeah, um, you have to and then I'm choose, also, choose your passions wisely. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm also going back to uni in September to do my master's degree um, because I am getting to a point where my career is starting to come to an end. I don't know what that end point is yet, um, but starting to think about that transition um, out of sport. So it not only sets me up for that, but it just gives me that other thing to think about other than mm-hmm. weightlifting because there's nothing worse than you have a bad session and that's just in your mind for the next 24 yeah. hours until you're back in the gym whether you've got something else going on it just allows you that kind of outlet to switch off from it yeah I think it's interesting and um, the way you mentioned about boxes as well because I think I do think people can kind of fall into that trap sometimes of like okay I, I am you know I'm into music or I'm a dancer or you know I'm into sport and I'm thinking that you can't do lots of these things so um yeah it really is good to try and like break that like narrative and I suppose societal norm that mm-hmm. that's the way it has to be and I, I think definitely in, in terms of what you what you've done between the pageantry and between the weightlifting like you call it an oxymoron but I no I think it's I think it's a really good thing like I think it's it's cool to have interests and that that are that are different and I know I've spoken to other athletes before and they're can be that stereotype of like oh you just you're just always in like you know sports gear and you're just always doing your sport or in the gym and like you'd never wear a dress and you never like to go out or whatever and and I've had athletes that are actually pretty can be pretty mad about it like no I I love an awards night or I I love getting to go out I just thought obviously by the nature of uh you know high performance and lead athletes like there's not necessarily always that opportunity yeah um but it is to try and break that and and you know for girls that are 
you know, if they're 12, 13, 14, you know, thinking that it that it's one or the other, that it's just absolutely not. And they they can do both and, and kind of encouraging them to um to stay involved in, in something like sport. Um obviously this is the period panel. So <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about periods. Um, do you remember getting your first period? I do actually. So I was like 14. I think like obviously gymnastics and stuff has an effect on that. But um we were going. It was like school trip day or something. We were going to Blackpool Pleasure Beach, which is a theme park. And I wanted to wear white shorts. <laughs> I was devastated. Like, I remember waking up that morning and then having that conversation. Like, my parents are very much like, through, like not, not in a bad way, like old fashioned in the sense of like, we just, we just never really talked about those things. Um, so I remember trying to like, have that conversation with mum. I went down to the breakfast table and mum and dad are sat there having breakfast. And like, that's just not the relationship I have with my dad. Like we have a great relationship, but that's not it. Um, <laughs> and like trying to be like, mum, can I talk to you? And then bursting into tears. Um, but yeah, my biggest, my biggest upset that day was the fact that I had to change my outfit plans. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, being involved in something like gymnastics, like that would be considered one of the sports that can be like a little bit more exposed. Um, I, I used to swim and which would be along the same kind of lines, um, even though arguably in the pool, you're actually okay until you step outside the pool, um, which if you, if you do leak or something, you know, blood next with water, it runs straight down your legs. So you can be very obvious if you, once you're outside yeah. the pool, but you know, obviously most of the training sessions tend to be in the pool, but yeah, between that and dance, and there's a couple other sports that can be quite exposed. Um, in terms of like kit and competition wear, like how did you manage that? How did you find your experience as an athlete or how, had you started to come to your, your end, the end of your kind of gymnastics career at that stage? Yeah, I was kind of towards the end of my gymnastics career. Um, I know like my gymnastics club was incredible. Um, you mm -hmm. obviously, the sport gets a lot of bad rap at the minute in the media, um, but I think you know it's that thing for every bad story there's a there's a ton of good stories um yeah. so it was a case of you could wear shorts over your leotard um mm -hmm. generally most of the older gymnasts could regardless like it was like if you want to wear shorts over you can um basically because of that um so yeah I don't think I ever competed once I got to that point um but yeah training wise like I'm fortunate that my club was was kind of good for that. Mm. Um, again, there wasn't really much talk about that kind of stuff in the gym mm. club. I think maybe, you know, that's something that there could have been more conversations around um, for those gymnasts as they kind of got to that point and that point in their mm. career. Um, but yeah, in terms of my experience, like it was positive from that point of view. Mm. Did you ever find that you're like a little bit concerned about having a period when you were training or was it something that you kind of, if the shorts were there as kind of a, a safety barrier almost that you have yeah. a bit of reassurance. I think the shorts were probably a safety barrier, especially because they were that like velour type fabric. So they were black, they were velour, and it's just like whether that bit thicker than maybe just like a thin lycra um, yeah. just kind of adds that like safety barrier to things a little bit. Um, so in relation to weightlifting now, uh, obviously it's very like numbers orientated. Um, do you notice the impact of your menstrual cycle around training competitions? Yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I use this as an example all the time when I, so I do a lot of workshops at like schools and clubs mm -hmm. and I just find lifting much easier to explain because it's numbers orientated so I'm always like okay so this is what could happen don't yeah. be getting upset over it rather than it can be kind of hard to explain you know if somebody goes out for a run and they just feel like lethargic or swimming and so the, the kids are like you know they could be playing football or they could be from different sports and they look at me I'm like okay I promise this is the easiest way to interpret what I'm trying to explain to you but um, yeah really interested to hear your your experience um around it yeah so um I mean, yesterday was day one of my cycles. This is interestingly timed, but like I woke up and I was like, I just can't be bothered today. Like it was just one of those like fatigue, um, cramps, that kind of stuff. And then the effects then on training, especially for what we do and that ability to like brace your middle becomes really difficult because obviously okay. you've got all of the cramps and everything. And then you're trying to brace and getting your body to do something else on top of it, already trying to, protect itself and do everything it's doing so 
it's definitely a lot harder to to brace into those positions and then obviously you just can't lift as much weight mm -hmm. um a big thing for me is my coordination just goes out of the window like I could trip over the pattern on a carpet some days <laughs> like during my cycle <laughs> um so when you're lifting heavy weights that with very technical movements mm -hmm. like sometimes my coach doesn't even need to know he can just watch me warm up and he's like is it period week and I'm like yeah and he's like yeah I thought so let's just be sensible today and you know we're good that the coaching team are like that um mm -hmm. and again with along the lines of like the bracing like I struggle with like I almost get like a dull ache in my back which makes it then a lot harder to set my back into position yeah um which obviously your back needs to be tight if you're lifting heavy weights um so sometimes it's a case of just changing my program around um different mm -hmm. exercise selection um with the coordination stuff we actually recently had a conversation that okay maybe in this week we don't really push technical work um because it's obviously always technique tweaks even though I've been weightlifting forever <laughs> um there's always technical changes that need to be made and he's like okay maybe we just don't really push that we just aim mm -hmm. for kind of maintenance on this week and then the other three weeks we can really try and force the changes that we need um mm. the thing that's interesting is like my absolute strength is much higher so I'll find that I can squat bigger weights but my technical lifting does suffer with the weights um so yeah it's quite a an interesting balance um and obviously there's that thing that like your period isn't the same from month to month as well. Like mm -hmm. some, some cycles I can kind of just go through training as though it's a normal training session. Um, and then some months I'm like completely useless. <laughs> We're delighted to be working with Active Iron for season two of the period panel. I myself have been taking their supplements for over a year and have had a really positive experience. One of the best things about Active Iron is the fact that it's so gentle on the stomach. So now let's dive back into the period panel. It's really, it's really interesting to hear about the, the coordination side of things because um, I know there can be concerns around, you know, pitch sports like football or rugby, um, you know, basketball, that type of thing, anything that you're kind of turning. Mm -hmm. um, pe people be, can be kind of worried about ACLs, but yeah, the, the, there is um, that conversation around coordination and that as well. But yeah, it, it's interesting to hear the perspective from, from you and um obviously you want to make sure that you're getting it right because you can you know you <laughs> hurt yourself if it all goes wrong and and also like there could be lapses in concentration which like I know even you know if I'm in the gym and stuff and you're trying to lift something and you know sometimes it's it's autopilot and it works and other times if you're doing on autopilot you're just like oh oh I'm, I'm not actually able to pick that up right now <laughs> yeah um but yeah you obviously have to be careful because if you know things things can go wrong um and then in terms of like you mentioned that your your absolute power is stronger the week of your period so is that when you find that you would actually be able to lift the most yeah in terms of stuff that requires less technical yeah. so like I said with squats just kind of up and yeah, down yeah um in fact my other half said the other day he was like it's weird watching you train on period week he was like because sometimes you just look like an idiot and that you don't know what you're doing he's like and then you'll do one movement and I think you're an absolute superhero and I'm like <laughs> yeah that's that's fair um but yeah it's definitely a, an interesting one um and in terms of like with competition with us it's in a weight making sport. So it's like boxing, you have to get on the scales and weigh a certain yeah. amount. Um, so, you know, if that is wrong with your cycle and you're holding loads of water and you've got to get on the scales and weigh a certain amount, that mm -hmm. comes with its challenges as well. Um, actually in Tokyo um, for the Olympics, I woke up for my comp with the worst period I've just like ever. I don't know if it was also nerves and everything else that comes yeah yeah out. everything together and obviously then the effect that then that has on your bowels and stuff and I remember my coach coming up to the flat and walked in my teammate sat in this little pop-up sauna because she was lifting the same day so she's sweating out and he looks at me he's like you all right and I'm like I feel like my womb is trying to eject itself from my body along with my bowels and he just went oh okay <laughs> um yeah that was horrendous um and because of that, my body weight was heavier than I would have liked it to have been that morning. Yeah. Um, so there was that to factor in. Um, 
and then you know you get to competition and I didn't have the performance I wanted in Tokyo um and then the person that's like I don't want to blame it on this like yeah but you know that heavy period and I remember coming off the platform and seeing a woman that I know she's um she was on the executive board for the federation and um she she looks at me she was like you just didn't really look like yourself today what's up and I was like oh yeah I got my period and she was like how the did you snatch 100 kilos today and I'm like I I wish I could tell you but that just pure adrenaline um but again it's that thing you know that's been big in the media like I also had that fear of leaking and stuff because the toilets were far away they weren't that ideal um I mean personally like I use a menstrual cup which is fine generally day to day but if the toilets aren't really set up that great for that and they're not that clean then you know it's not as easy as just kind of disposable um stuff so you know all those other factors that then come into it um yeah yeah becomes a lot more there can be a lot to think about like you know obviously how you feel physically is is one side of things and um you know you have to try and get your head straight and I'm I'm sure you know from your perspective you're like okay I you know this is this is the day that it is Mm -hmm. um but try and try and park it and just get out there and and do your best which you know some days can be easier than others but yeah when logistics and everything comes into it too um yeah when if there's you know no bathrooms or bathrooms are far away and all that type of thing it can be kind of a bit off-putting like obviously you're, you're out of your like your comfort zone as well like your your own kind of comfortable environment so um talk to me a bit about the leaking and that um you know it's it's obviously you know something that girls worry about but do you think that we will ever get to a point where it will be something that we just won't care about like I know there's you know I've seen a couple of campaigns where people are you know demonstrating that like a nose bleed and on period blood like it's all just blood it's all just the same like do you ever think that we'll actually get to a point where that will be the reactions that you actually could go out and you're like you know if I leak I leak and I just don't care um or do you think we'll always kind of have a shame and embarrassment with it I'd like to think we can get there. Like there was an article recently with the triathlon girl, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she's just like, it is what it is. Like you, I can yeah. post this photo and whatever else, but I'm a female athlete and it happens and we yeah. can't all pretend that no one's on their period competition. <laughs> in the field of athletes, like there's going to be a, at least a person. Surely 25%, like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um yeah, I'd like to think we could get there. I think a lot of it kind of comes down to that thing of having men in our corner and men being feminists. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're very fortunate that like our coaching team, they've just learned to deal with it. Like we sent a full mm-hmm. team of women to Tokyo and no men. Uh, we have a full male senior coaching team. They've just had to learn. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. You know, we've got something like Stu is 34. So he's a little bit more kind of just deals with it um but you know Dave and Andy are in their 50s so as a generational difference um it's taken them a little bit longer um Mm. but you know it's it's one of those things and I think it requires like I said men to kind of champion it with us Mm -hmm. um to be able to get to that point I think there'll always be idiots on the internet because unfortunately that's the way of the world (laughs) um but I'd like to think we can get there um and you know with it being more mainstream now the stuff with like the lionesses and the Wimbledon changing their rulings yeah and all that kind of stuff I feel like we are getting there um but it's still another many years ahead of us yeah yeah no look obviously not everyone's always going to be on the same page but if we can get like the majority you know to to have that um I suppose support and like not just make people feel embarrassed um would be would be huge progress and on, on this definitely like um it's trying to instill confidence in the girls and on the women and and that starts for for the girls it starts at a young age like you need to you know talk to them about it. like the sooner the better you know and um, like the the swim team that I was involved in um we wouldn't have really talked about it um mm-hmm. you know I I remember like I leaked when I was probably 12 or 13 and an older athlete had had happened to her before so she uh, like she told me about her story or whatever and I was like yeah okay I was like yeah you know that's that's normal um but from a coaching perspective it actually it, it never really came up and we never spoke about it as a full you know as all the female athletes together or or as the entire squad like why not bring everybody in on the conversation but um by the time my sister came through so she's six and a half years younger than me 
now for her it was when she was about 17 so that's probably about 11 years later mm-hmm. um they did have a, a, a kind of group discussion with all the girls so there there was like that progress starting to be made and I definitely find with the workshops we do with the kids um you know if you're there to kind of push the door open and start the conversation so if they're 11 12 13 like once somebody does it and they realize that it's normal and they realize like oh actually maybe my friend does have her period or maybe she might need shorts someday or maybe I can you know give her a tampon or whatever that like you can ask for these things and it just speeds up the process because for me I would have found like by the time you get to like by the time I went to college people were happy enough to talk about it but at that stage like people have had their period for like six seven eight years yeah. where if we can bring that back down into school and let them have the conversation then then their confidence should be in abundance by the time they get to college yeah. or work or anything like that we've um, had um, a push in the organization you know to have more like availability to you know tampons and that kind of stuff mm-hmm. um, in changing rooms and really getting the push for that and there's been a lot more drive um, of female athletes like health and stuff within weightlifting so I think that's mm-hmm. quite cool to try and start that conversation sooner and, and as we just said like the effect of performance on weightlifting like it's yeah. it's major so that conversation needs to be there not only from a health and the mental side of things but also to help athletes understand that mm-hmm. it does affect performance like one of the talent transfer girls came and trained at the training at the gym with us the other day and I was like bit of a weird one I was like are you on your period by any chance and she was like well She's brand new you're straight in <laughs> yeah yeah I was like hi I'm Sarah let's talk periods <laughs> um yeah and she was like well yeah but and I was like there's no but about it like be kind to yourself like it's gonna yeah. happen she's like yeah but I should be able to do this I'm like you literally just watch me miss like 70 percent because I understand what you're going through um and like having those conversations and she's like but I don't want it to be an excuse yeah, and like, yeah. I look back on my Tokyo performance and I'm like, I never made a statement about it because I was like, I don't want people to think it's an excuse for like the way I performed. Um, you know, it's just a fact. It's not an excuse. Like, that yeah, yeah. The but that's the thing. It It is about having the, you know, on one hand, sometimes you're just like, OK, it's my business and I don't want to tell everybody about it. And that's totally fine. Like, it's not like we don't always want to go around with like a label on our head saying like, oh, I'm a period today. <laughs> like, Because it's, you know, it's it's enough to deal with it as it is. Like you've to, you know, sometimes, you know, if, like if I'm sitting and working and stuff, I'm like, oh, geez. it's just it, it, it can make things like slightly more difficult in life yeah. sometimes. Um, But at the same time, like the more, you know, people talk about it and say, if you had mentioned it at that stage it's just it's normal and it's such a good you know example for other athletes to you know first of all consider it and, and coaches and parents as well but first of all consider it that it, it can be a factor and not like you know how amazing is that you you do go out and you do compete and you do you know maybe not what exactly what you wanted to but you're still you know performing at the olympic games <laughs> and uh, you know still lifting impressive weight and everything like that and um you know it, I, I think it demonstrates that like you know you understand where you're coming from Mm -hmm. um you want more um but that you have to unfortunately just take some of these things you know in your stride whether like we just don't really have the option unfortunately um but like it's I think I've seen more people speak about it recently and as you said the the girl the girl um from triathlon like I think that gained a lot of traction and it was powerful for her to just say like look this is normal like this this is the way it is and in some like you know ultra events like if you're doing something like an ultra marathon or a marathon like yeah depending on on you know how heavy your period is or what the story is it you know it, it to avoid leaking like sometimes the answer would be just not entering the race at all which we just don't want to see people doing yeah. so um but yeah I definitely think that there's more conversation around it at the moment which is great and, and it is starting to get younger but um in relation to the performance as you mentioned like from the coach's perspective like if they want to get the most out of you and they want to structure your coaching and everything properly like they that they're the conversations that they need to have and understand and and mm-hmm. um, then everybody's different too so it's not a one size fits all yeah. um yeah. how do you find that in your own coaching uh, are you coaching you know boys and girls men and women or have you mostly women mostly men yeah um I've got a pretty even kind of split at the minute um the one that that is interesting is one of my athletes um she's a master's lifter she's 36 seven um and 
she's on the marina coil so she doesn't necessarily have a period but mm-hmm. the thing that's interesting is you still get that cycle so she'll still mm-hmm. have a week where her coordination just goes out the window um and it's about having it took it took a little while and I was like we sort of had that conversation I was like oh I need a period she was like oh I don't have a period because I'm on the yeah. coil and I was like okay well I need you to start tracking for me like these symptoms um so we can be a little bit more aware of like where that cycle yeah, still sits um and you know it's interesting that she then still gets that kind of that week mm. where although she's not having a period you still get a lot of the kind of other things that come as well as the bleeding um so yeah it's one of those that to have that conversation um I've got a couple of like younger like 18 19 um females that I've taken on recently and again that kind of conversation conversation around nutrition as well for training um and just kind of listening to your body which again in a weight making sport people are constantly aware of body weight because you don't want to get too heavy and and yeah but just give your body the fuel that it needs this week like you're not going to cause damage like you're not going to over consume that much food that you gain that significant amount of weight and we can factor it into the other three weeks so that we're you know kind of working on that and having those conversations but sometimes I watch like my male athletes and they send videos for and I'm like imagine being able to train just for four weeks like consistently without any interruption like a little bit jealous um but yeah it's um it's interesting to to have those conversations um like I said even with people and the woman that's a master's lifter like she's a doctor like she's a smart woman she's you know obviously had a period for however many years but still having those conversations Mm -hmm. around training because they're just the conversations aren't there frequently enough Mm -hmm. um, across the board so um it's definitely interesting to see like how people respond and generally people are like yeah but and I'm like there's no but about it Yeah, yeah yeah this is the case yeah, no, that's it. Look, it's it's good to hear that there's different people out there trying to just you know educate people more and more. And, and I think the the but part of the response is just almost like you know we're trying to not use it as an excuse, like like we've kind of talked about a bit already. Like we don't want to you know be seen as you know weaker or that there's a compromise or. Mm-hmm um you know that, that we can't do things that we want to do but you know it is it is biology and you know it, it's it's just something that's kind of you know out of our control and and I think the other thing you know to look at and I I, I um, spoke to Rachel Burford on um the period panel before she played rugby for England and she was saying like we need to look at having a, a menstrual cycle having a period as a superpower like from a an injury perspective like if we lose our periods it's a a warning signal of as you said like nutrition you mightn't be you know feeling yourself enough you might be overtraining your stress like it's stress in any form like whatever it is whether it's physical or mental and it it is that warning signal of like look something's off kilter um but men don't have that so we can actually use that to to our advantage um and then as we're saying as well like yes we might not have that consistency that men do but we do have you know, a couple of days or, or, or it could be a week in, in your cycle where you're like, oh my God, I'm s- such an amazing athlete. Yeah. <laughs> like you can just do these things and you're like, you know, whether it's in the gym or like you're running, you go out and you're like, you just like feel great. And you're like, oh, okay. Like that is actually, you know, related to, to what, what your cycle might be. So, yeah. um, you know, it is, it is interesting to hear actually, I think that that piece about the coil for people to actually understand that, you know, maybe if they are, um, you know, on, on, you know, different birth controls or, or contraceptives that, um, it, it, you know, there can still be a, a cycle going on and, and to try and track that and figure it out. Um, in relation to tracking, do you use like an app? Do you use a diary? Like, how do you find the best way to actually track the symptoms and uh, what kind of symptoms would you be, would you be looking at? Yeah. So I do use an app just to kind of predict my period and stuff. Um, yeah. To be fair, like, my like contraception birth control journey has been an interesting one um so I had the copper coil fitted in 2019 um and then Mm -hmm. back end of last year like I was getting like really heavy periods like 10 12 days of period really bad pains everything else so I went to the doctors eventually got through the NHS to a point that you know my coil had moved slightly so it was creating all the pains and whatever else um so then that kind of put me off having the copper one, um, mm-hmm. but still went for the coil, went for a marina. 
had that put in in January and I'm like I'll give it six months I'm not a point I'm like this needs to come out like it makes Uh me a level of crazy that I just I think having non-hormone birth control for the last you know eight years as well like either whatever it was um not having the hormones so then putting them in I just I feel like it accentuates like the extremes um and then you feel the the negative extremes more than the positive so um I am looking at like kind of taking that out and going for the like natural cycles approach um yeah. so that's something that I'm currently looking into um because like I wear a tracking ring which takes my temperature which you can obviously use then as like birth control and stuff like that um but yeah I do kind of keep an eye on like my period and then knowing when to push like you said you have that kind of week for me it's like just after I feel like superwoman so as I've kind of week two into week three um using that time to really kind of push through my training um when I feel my mm. best and get the most out of those sessions um before we then kind of deload just before like my mm. period comes um because I know that's when the fatigue the fatigue will start to come at the start of my period if I'm already fatigued going into that I feel horrendous Mm -hmm. so if we start to deload it off just before um I know that then when I go into my period I can kind of pick my training gradually back up again yeah yeah um through into the kind of middle of my cycle yeah it's just kind of getting a good understanding of your body and trying to maximize the opportunities that it presents I suppose and um, you mentioned a bit about nutrition and I know um you're doing some work for Active Orange so talk to us a little bit about, about the nutrition side of things making sure that you're um you know feeding your body properly and and giving it all the right nutrients yeah so I did my nutrition qualification a few years ago um and it's something that I'm interested in and you know I wouldn't say I do anything particularly wild with my nutrition like making sure my protein is high enough um is a big thing and then you know just maintenance kind of calories um around my period like I will give in to the cravings if I need them like your body has the cravings for a reason um so if I do need that little bit more sugar um I find I'll have more like intra training like either snacks or like a carb type drink um just to help with that fatigue level that I feel Mm -hmm. um so kind of listening to my body with that um the active iron stuff really interesting and now working with them the benefit has like I bought the product anyway and then I ended up they reached out to me and um we ended up working together but um in April this year I had some blood tests done um just out of interest because like I just felt constantly fatigued um Mm -hmm. and you know I'm like I'm doing the right things I'm eating right I'm training I'm resting I'm sleeping like all of that sort of stuff um and my iron levels were really low like not to a point of um being anemic but like really kind of dicing on that line um and I think you know as I said I was having kind of 10 12 day bleeds um where my coil had been in the wrong place and I thought I'd done enough to get my iron back up again but clearly not um And the difference that I've noticed since taking iron, like I'm one of these that I'll, you know, I'll take health supplements. I was taking a multivitamin. I was taking my omega. I was taking some vitamin D, but actually having the blood test to know what that's like for me, because obviously every person is different on how you absorb, how much your body needs, all that kind of stuff. Um, The difference since I've been taking my iron, like I get out of bed in the morning, like it's not kind of lying there being like, okay, we'll get up and we'll get moving. Like, I get up, I take my active iron and like that sets me for the day, um, which is, you know, the difference. I'm always a little bit skeptical that whether you'll feel a difference with a product, which is why like, you know, I bought the product anyway, because for me, they have to be um, informed sport tested so that there's nothing else in it. So that's one of the reasons I I went to active iron in the first place. Um, And, you know, I'll never work with a company if I don't believe in it like it's just I'm not going to do anything for a paycheck like it's just not how I roll can you can pay me as much as you want if I don't believe in it I'm just not going to do it yeah Um, so it's really nice to work with Active Iron and had that kind of line up really nicely that you know they're now supporting me for the rest of the year with with products and stuff um and keeping me you know feeling good um I had blood tests taken again um two weeks ago 
um, my iron levels are now back in a healthy kind of place. And that's after, mm-hmm. you know, just two months um, supplements. Um, yeah. I'll obviously maintain it. Um, but yeah, it was really interesting to know that my iron levels were that low when I, you know, I eat red meat, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I think is something for people to be aware of. If you can get hold of it, um, of a blood test, then then do so. Um, if not, you know, there's kind of no harm in like just trying something and, and seeing how you get on with mm. it. Um, the good thing with them is you don't get any of the like, or I don't get any of the like stomach pains and stuff that, you know, iron can sometimes give people like constipation and stuff like that um, when they take it. But yeah, so it's been a cool little couple of months. Yeah, and getting your your body to the right place to be able to do what you wanted to do and all that type of thing. Um, look, I think that was a a really really interesting conversation. Thanks so much for for taking the time to chat to us. And um, we look forward to watching you over the next couple of months. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Period Panel. Thanks for listening. Be sure to connect with Her Sport across all of the social media platforms, particularly on Instagram, because we'll be putting up a question box before we shoot every episode. Our episodes will be a combination of athletes and health experts and we'll direct your question to the person that's best able to answer. We hope to see you again at the next episode of the Period Panel.